it starts. Today, we have the honor of speaking to the Right Honorable Sir Vince Cable, the former leader of the Liberal Democrats. In 1982, he defected the Labour Party for the newly formed Social Democratic Party, which later became the Lib Dems. In the Lib Dem Tory coalition between 2010 and 2015, he was the Cabinet Secretary of State for Business, Innovation and Skills. After being a part of this coalition, the Lib Dems had a quite a disappointing election result in 2015. They went from 57 to only eight seats. In 2017, however, Mr. Cable became the party leader. And under his leadership, the Lib Dems managed to almost double their share of the vote again in the European Parliament elections with the slogan, bollocks to Brexit. At this high point, he stepped down as the leader of the Lib Dems. And afterwards, unfortunately for the Lib Dems, the 2019 general elections resulted in a big victory for the Conservative Party, the Tories, the party of Boris Johnson, and the Lib Dems lost a seat. What explains these rather disappointing election outcomes for the Lib Dems in the past elections? And what can they, and perhaps also other liberal democratic parties in Europe, do to become bigger again and to attract more voters? Also, how do Brexit and now Corona affect British politics? Should the UK's winner-takes-all system be replaced for a more Dutch system? And how did Mr. Cable spend the lockdown? This and more we will all try to answer in our podcast today. Mr. Cable, it's an honor that you're joining us today. Thank you. So during the lockdown, for me, it felt like everyone had their own little quarantine projects and hobbies that they picked up again. And we found out in our research um, about you that you are a ballroom dancer. And we were wondering if you were able to continue this hobby during the lockdown. I'm afraid not, no. I think if, if you think of all the hobbies that are disrupted by um, the, the virus, ballroom dancing is probably the worst. Because I dance with my teacher, mm -hmm. uh, who also dances with other people. So um, it, it's a ready-made transmission mechanism. And in <laughs> fact, the ballroom dancing industry, if I can call it that, Mm -hmm. It's in serious trouble in the UK. All the dance halls are threatened with bankruptcy. The coaches have no future for the foreseeable future. It's very sad. Um, anyway, I hope to get back to it eventually. What I have been doing instead is uh, a lot of cycling and walking. I live in the middle of, uh, at the moment with my wife, in the middle of the New Forest, which is a beautiful area in the south of England. Mm -hmm of virgin countryside and forest lands and you can go for miles and miles and not see anybody. Uh, so I'm very fit um, without the ballroom dancing. Um, the rest of my time was finishing a book and starting a new one. Okay, cool. Um, let's then now dive into the more, uh, yeah, let's say serious uh, subject matter. Uh, during your talk at the Oxford Union in November uh, 2019, you said that the Brexit was actually the most important uh, topic in British politics right now and that nothing could be separated from it, really. So we were wondering, with the current corona crisis happening, does that, this put the, the corona or does this put the Brexit into uh, perspective? Yes, it does. I mean, it, it is a sort of massive uh, public health and economic crisis that rather swamps the Brexit issue, which had dominated British politics consistently and overwhelmingly for about four years. So yes, it has put it in context. Um, but of course, Brexit potentially adds to the problem. It hasn't happened yet. I mean, Britain has left the European Union, but the transitional year, we're still in the middle of it. Um, what happens at the end is highly uncertain. And given that one of the main problems with the a coronavirus pandemic is the creation of uncertainty and fear. Um, I'm afraid Brexit is going to add to those problems. And I, so I suspect that we're going to go back to debating Brexit before very long. Of course, the other reason why it's not been discussed in the UK anymore very much is that the issue was resolved in the general election in a bad way, but it was resolved under the British system. The Tories got a big majority and are just pressing ahead. There's no point arguing about it anymore. Uh, the issue is, uh, at least in principle, settled. So you then would not, no longer advocate for a second referendum as your party had done before? No, there's no point. Um, I mean, we, we did push for a second referendum. We can argue that 
the tactics um, at the end of last year were not very clever and we could have persisted and got a second referendum uh, with the right coalitions, uh, but it didn't happen. Um, we lost that argument. Um, the election took over and Brexit happened. So you can't have a second referendum on whether to have Brexit if Brexit's already taken place. Okay, but why, why do you then think that you will actually rethink the whole Brexit? I think it will be some years. I don't think this is going to happen overnight. I, I don't think any way that the European Union, our friends in Europe, would be terribly happy if the British just came back and said, we want to renegotiate everything all over again. And then the Conservatives say, we'll re re renegotiate it all over again and, and we get into a kind of silly world. Uh, I mean, the fact is that the British have left. A bad decision, but it's happened. Uh, we will have to see how it plays out in the next five to ten years. And I think there may well be some rethinking, uh, particularly if the European Union evolves. I mean, it may be that the, the, the traditional model of, was it 28 countries moving in step, doesn't happen. You, know, you have a tight core and then you have a looser group of countries who are tied economically but not in monetary ways and politically. And the British may may then come back in that form. I, I don't know. I mean, I think we just got to let uh, let this happen. Um, maybe five, ten years, we have a fresh look at it. Okay, we want to uh, to move on to move on to the uh, to the Liberal Democrats as a as a party. So for the for the Dutch uh, student that maybe not be so familiar with the Liberal Democrats and their standpoints, uh, if you had to define the Liberal Democrats in three standpoints which ones would you choose um well in dutch terms it's an amalgam of the d66 and the vvd isn't it it's a, it's a bit of each um yeah. it's a liberal uh, but also social democratic okay and 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 you 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 have often argued in in in, in the past that the left right scale is is a bit outdated nowadays so we were wondering which scale would you now use to characterize the differences between different parties in the UK and, and where would the Lib Dems be on that scale? Um, well, I, I haven't got good language, but uh, I think we increasingly see the world as sort of outward looking or inward looking. Um, from the Conservatives, of course, used to be called right wing, but then they're, they're more interventionist these days that they are very, what I would call inward looking, that's what Brexit is all about. And I think the Lib Dems are at the extreme on the other side. I mean, you know, we are the most, arguably the most internationalist um, liberal with a small L. Um, so if you're looking at the a, a dialectic uh, along those lines, then we are at one extreme rather than in the middle, which is where we used to be when it was characterized as right versus left. Yeah, so you already mentioned that um, the Lib Dems is very much like a mixture of the D66 and the VVD. And we were also quite, quite curious about this comparison because the D66, so the Dutch Liberal Democratic Party, has this problem that they tend to mainly attract the highly educated cosmopolitan elite to their party. Um, and we were wondering if the Lib Dem if the Lib Dems have the same, and whether you see this as a problem at all, and, and how you deal with this? Yes, it is a similar problem. Um, I mean, I th I th it's very difficult to discuss this without reference to the particular uh, features of the British voting system, which to you will see completely bizarre, um, which is that you always choose the, the party that you dislike least. Um, it, it is all about tactical voting and um, positioning in particular constituencies rather than trying to get your maximum vote. So um, the, the point about it, in general, it is true that our demographic is young, uh, highly educated, um, and as you say, cosmopolitan. Um, that, that, that's roughly where our support is. But the other feature of it is that it tends to be very localised. You know, there are some parts of the country, like my constituency in Twickenham in southwest London, where we are the governing party. You know, everybody votes for us. 
uh, because for historical reasons we built up a local base. Um, and there are pockets around the country um, where the Lib Dems have been uh, the main party of local government or the main, in some cases, national government. There are not many of those. Uh, and we, in those areas, we, we have very broad uh, cross-cutting support. But um, I think if we were trying to generalise, we, we don't do well in the, the, the kind of working class areas. Uh, we don't do well with ethnic minorities either. Is there something you want to change about it or something that's like some, some solutions that you have for this? Or do you think that's, that's fine the way it is? Yes, I know it isn't fine. Um, and I suppose the, the lazy answer is to say that the system is dreadful and, um, you know, we're having to operate as best we can within it um, and we want to change the system. But no, we, the Lib Dems, um, 10 years ago, uh, we had 20% of public support and it fluctuated sometimes 15, sometimes 20, sometimes 25%. I mean, it was a very healthy support base. Uh, since the disaster of 2015, the, the support base has shrunk. I mean, it's um, on a good day, it's 10%, 12%. On a bad day, it's 6 or 7 So we're, we're, we're now operating with much lower numbers. Um, so the, in the days when we used to reach out to a, to a wider constituency, including many small farmers, um, you know, a lot of lower middle class people, um, the, the, that's, that is largely gone. And what, what I tried to do what, with, when I was the leader was, was try to build that base back up again. But and how did you do that? We, we seemed to achieve it. Um, well, I think in two ways. One is having a, a national message, which is a bit more inclusive. Um, I, I tended, when I was the leader, to shy away from the rather... Um, fringe um, issues, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not transphobic, but I wouldn't make, make that the big issue of politics as many of my colleagues wanted to do. I would concentrate on mainstream uh, economic issues around taxation and public spending. I mean, that's the kind of thing the public engage with. Um, but also, you know, just my other, you know, my basic technique was just to work uh, relentlessly uh, building up the local government base again. We used to control uh, cities right across Britain. Um, in the last local election, when I was the leader, we had the biggest um, local election victories in our whole history. We won over 700 seats. And we've got now back to controlling many, many uh, small towns, suburbs, um, not yet big cities, but we will get to that. Um, so my, my strategy was to build up the base through local government. Yeah. Um, another problem that D666 in the Netherlands has is that they always seem to lose the elections after they have been in a government. And the same thing appeared to be true for, for the Lib Dems as well after the, after the coalition in 2010 with the, uh, with the Conservatives. And we were thinking, why does this seem to keep happening to liberal parties after being in a, in a government? Um, I wish I knew the answer. Um, <laughs> well, it, we have, we, unlike you, we don't have very much experience. This was the first coalition since the Second World War. Um, so it wasn't, a, no, there is no trend. Uh, but it's certainly true that if people on the left, um, traditional left, become disillusioned with with my party as, as they did they've got other people to go to um they go to the labor party or they go to the greens uh so you you are quite vulnerable on the on the left side yeah. and not so much on the right and i guess that's the problem with d66 um on the right side um well you know people will always prefer the conservatives to us because they're a more authentic you know, right-wing party. Um, I mean, I noticed that Rutter has worked very hard to prevent his support going after the extreme right. That's not a problem we have to worry about. Um, but no, I, I think what the, what the conclusion I came to after the coalition 
is that it would be completely uh, counterproductive for the Lib Dems ever to go into another formal coalition until the voting system has changed because you just get hammered um, it's suicidal um, and I you know that, that so that was the position I took uh, in the in that period period okay that's very interesting because we will actually talk about the the UK political system in uh, I think around five minutes uh, we want to quickly before we move on to that part we want to talk about the general elections in 2019 because you previously ex expressed uh, in 2019 that you were very positive about the chances uh, for the Liberal Democrats to do a good job in the general elections. Uh, however, they only in the end got 11 seats. So why do you think they were in the end so less popular than you, than you thought beforehand? Um, well, when I left the leadership, we were 20, 22% in the polls. Uh, that was after those very good local elections and the European elections. Now, I think it was inevitable uh, that some of that support was going to shrink um, because of the way the voting system works. We're, we're, we weren't in contention in the vast majority of seats, so people inevitably polarised between the other parties. So we're going to lose some support, but not, I think, as much as happened. Um, we went down from 2022 20, back down to 10%, which actually was an improvement on the previous year at the time. It was uh, 11 to 7 before that, we got up to 10. Yeah. Um, so what went wrong? I think, first of all, the anti-Brexit vote was badly split. We did have a pact with the Green Party and with the Welsh Nationalists, but in the end that didn't make a great deal of difference, that we didn't have an agreement with the Labour Party, we couldn't have an agreement with them because they had a kind of Marxist-Leninist leadership which just couldn't couldn't work with them um, and didn't want to work with them. So what happened in you know areas around London and where we were strong, uh, the southeast relatively prosperous constituencies, um, a lot of um, socialist voters stuck with the Labour Party rather than voted tactically for us. So the vote, the vote was split. The second thing which we couldn't avoid was that the, um, what you might call the conservative remainers, the people who wanted Britain to stay in Europe, but normally vote conservative, we, we, we hoped and expected that they will switch to us. But that never happened. Um, because they were terrified of the Labour Party. Uh, there was a real fear that, you know, this extreme left uh, Corbynite party would get into government. And I encountered dozens, hundreds of people on the doorstep who said, we'd love to vote for you. We like your party. Uh, we think you should be in Parliament, in government. But we cannot risk letting these... Um, loony left people into power so they stuck with the conservatives even though they were against brexit um so those were the kind of what you might call the structural reasons i think in addition um and i need to be careful because this was after i had left the leadership and i don't just i don't want to criticize joe personally but i think there were some bad tactical mistakes um which the party made. I think the first was this, instead of arguing for a referendum, they argued that for simply revoking Brexit altogether, just said, look, we want to cancel it. First thing we'll do in government without a referendum. I think people were confused. They thought that was arrogant. Um, it didn't help our support. Um, and I think, you know, Joe was advised by the people around her to go around saying, I'm the next prime minister, which is fine in principle. If you're the leader of a serious party, you want to be prime minister. But I think given our support levels, people thought it was ridiculous. And um, it, it certainly cost us quite a bit of support. So, so it was a mixture of big structural factors and tactical errors. And what do you think of the new leader of, of, the, of the Labour Party? Well, we haven't got one yet. Um, there is a competition taking place at the moment on uh, uh, remotely. Uh, we're in the process of choosing uh, right now. I haven't cast my ballot yet. Okay. 
but, uh, but I guess there's a new leader in, 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 in Parliament, right? Is that, is that correct? Um, well, we've got an acting leader, which yeah, is Ed, exactly. Ed, Ed Davey. Yes, he was, he's long been my colleague. Uh, we were in the coalition cabinet. Um, he has the next door parliamentary constituency to the one I had. He's a very sensible, practical, competent, intelligent leader. I mean, I think people will say he's not particularly radical or exciting, um, but you don't necessarily need that. But th th those are his qualities. He's, he's very solid in the, the English expression, a safe pair of hands. Uh, the alternative, Leila Moran, is more interesting in some way, more exotic. Um, she has an interesting background. Her, um, her mother is Palestinian. Uh, she grew up in that environment uh, in uh, formerly Israel, and um, you know is steeped in in a much more kind of international tradition. She is a former school teacher in mathematics. Um, it's, 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 it, we use the expression "sparky." You know, has kind of exciting, interesting ideas. Some people might feel she has she's a bit too unorthodox and will turn off some traditional voters. Um, she describes herself as pansexual. I'm not quite sure what that means, but it's um, it's part of the new way of, of looking at relationships, and probably has quite a bit of appeal to um, you know very open-minded younger people. That it has the come. Or to voters in Amsterdam. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> okay, so that's. Um, uh, th those are the two candidates, and they both be good. I mean, I don't have strong feelings either way. Okay, so now with an eye to the future. So we analyzed a little bit, or you analyzed um, what went wrong. But for a next election, what advice would you give the current Lib Dem leader on, on what should be kind of the new voice or the new issues that the Lib Dems focus on to, to become bigger again and to attract a broad voting base? Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm rather careful about dispensing advice. I don't. I think the one thing that leaders don't want is their predecessors <laughs> leaning over their shoulder and saying, "You should do this. You should." Do. We call this backseat driving. Um, you can um, tell us here. I think they won't watch our Dutch podcast. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think the big change, and the big change that the Lib Dems are going to have to adapt to is that the Labour Party have suddenly become quite sensible uh, after years of being a kind of the whole of the decade, more or less, being a, a way out on the left and under Corbyn, the extreme left. Um, they've now got a good leader, uh, Keir Starmer, very sensible, practical, likable, uh, and he will now uh, attract a lot of centre-left votes that previously migrated to the Conservatives, they will come back. Uh, it will be very difficult for the Labour Party to win the next election, but it's possible. It wasn't possible a few months ago, but it is now possible. Yes, now, I, mean, I think previously we, we had quite a, a small misunderstanding. So I, I was actually asking about the, the what, what you thought of the new leader of, of oh, the yes. Labour, Labour Party. I thought about uh, <laughs> okay, sorry. So, so you, you prefer him over, over, over Kerbin? Uh, Oh, my, my, yeah, he's different, different league altogether. Uh, he is a serious contender and would probably be a good prime minister, actually. Um, and the problem for the Lib Dems is that most of the voters will think so as well. And they will say, well, why should we vote for the Lib Dems? So why not? Uh, I think a couple of reasons. I mean, I think there are areas where a kind of radical liberal voice is going to be needed whereas Starmer's instincts are to play safe. In what kind of areas? Not to offend areas. Um, well, it may be, um, I mean, a, a, a good example are these r riots which took place recently about Black Lives Matter and the toppling of statues. And Starmer was very reluctant to say anything that would offend what you might call the middle class law and order voters. Um, Whereas I think the Lib Dems probably should have gone, more, taken a more radical position in support of the protesters. That's, a, that's an example. But, but actually the main uh, thing we have to do 
uh, is to try and work on a complementary basis because there are a lot of seats, parliamentary seats, maybe 50, where the Labour Party stand absolutely no chance of winning, no chance at all. But the Lib Dems do, you know, where we're currently in second place. They may have had Lib Dem councillors. Um, there is a tradition of Lib Dem support, but no Labour support. So if the Lib Dems concentrate, on those areas, the 50 seats, and they try to reach, you can't reach an official pact, but an unofficial pact with the Labour Party, that they concentrate on winning where they can win, and we concentrate on winning where we can win, then there is an opportunity for the Lib Dems to recover. This is, in other words, it's a repeat of 1997. I don't know if you know the history of the Tony Blair victory in 1997, uh, but they had a landslide. Uh, but the Lib Dems more than doubled their seats as well, because we had an unwritten agreement with the Labour Party that they left certain parts of the country alone, and we fought those. Okay, so I think it's been a long time coming in this interview, the, the structural changes that we've talked about, or that you've talked about, um, to the voting system in the UK, because we're of course from the Netherlands and we have a proportional voting system and we have a lot of parties. Whereas <coughs> in the UK you see these two parties dominating, there's a winner takes all voting system. Could you explain to us exactly why you seem to be more in favor of the Dutch approach as opposed to the English approach? Um, no, I'm not afraid in favor of the Dutch approach either. I think the model <laughs> Uh, the, the model which we tend to advocate is more, more of the German style. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think there is an appetite in Britain for having a proliferation of parties, which is what you have in Holland. And <clears throat> but I think the German system, which tries to combine proportionality with constituencies, is the kind of optimum system. And actually, we do have good examples of it in the UK, because in Scotland, uh, they have the German model, basically. They have a constituency, uh, constituency uh, members of the Scottish Parliament, and then they have a top-up system um, uh, to reflect the share of votes. So, you know, we, we can see it in action. Uh, people may not like the Scottish nationalists, but they have a very good system in Scotland. Uh, and I think we could easily adapt it. Okay, so so you're advocating for the German approach, kind of a, a middle way between maybe the yeah. Dutch and the English system. But why do you think that a German approach is so necessary for the UK? What's going wrong right now? Well, the UK system is highly dysfunctional. I mean, you know, we're getting, um, except the coalition government, when we had a government that, enjoyed overall about 65 70 percent of public support at the beginning um, we're getting governments elected with large majorities in westminster but w without majority su support in the country uh, and that's very difficult to rule effectively especially as now when you, you, you know the conservative party are now controlled by one extreme faction you know the nationalist pro-Brexit group, and this is a very bad way to run a country. I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit like uh, what's happening in the United States. You, you know, you're getting very partisan politics. People won't cooperate. Um, you get polarized extremes. Uh, that's a, it's not, 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 not a very good system of government. But, but what, course, what, what do you then think is the, is the biggest bottleneck right now for, for achieving such a political system change? Well, the biggest bottleneck is if you're one of the winners, you're not going to give it up, are you? Um, exactly. Yeah. The Conservatives uh, are obviously not going to surrender uh, one of their main assets, which is the voting system. Um, how, but, how will you be able to overcome such a... Such well, a I, I think the hope, um, and it may be we've been disappointed before, but it could happen in future, is that the Labour Party take the view <clears throat> that their chances of getting into government uh, they will, it will happen every 20 or 30 years, but that they are better served by a more consensual arrangement. Um, and although we have our differences with the Labour Party, they're not so vast. Uh, and I would hope that working with them, with the Greens and others, 
uh, we can build up a sufficient um, opposition demand for a reform in the voting system and that the Lib Dems on the kind of scenario I described to you earlier would obviously make it a condition for any future support even the not a coalition but a, a background support uh, that, that the voting system was changed. And do you think that the British people want it? Because of course you had the referendum in 2011 that that was about a political system change and, and in which the British public actually voted against uh, a change. So do you think um, that that uh, for the vote that the majority voted against the uh, referendum in 2011 do you think that was because the alternative was actually worse than what you have right now or what do you I, think, I think that caused? in 2011 it was not a debate that really took off uh, and the, the 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 large parties the Tory and Labour Party were driven not so much by arguments as purely tactical considerations. If the Labour Party had supported the voter reform in 2011, it would have happened. But they, partly because they were angry with the Lib Dems for joining the coalition with the Conservatives, they refused to support it. It was a rather petulant, um, but that was what happened. Um, Indeed, they were using Conservative Party literature and the Conservatives were using Labour Party attacks on the Lib... We, we, were, we were just attacked by everybody um, instead of having a kind of broadly based campaign for proportional voting. So the, so the campaign and, and the whole public debate was maybe the problem in 2011, but right now, do you think that the British public wants uh, a political system change i wouldn't say they they're wanting it but i think they would be persuaded more easily let me put it that way because we've had four years of completely unstable chaotic one party government i mean it's just we've had the disasters around brexit now we've got uh, a lot of you know disharmony around this uh, pandemic um, I think people feel that the British system isn't working and, you know, the, the countries that we used to look down on, you know, Ireland was thought to be a very backward place with a terribly um, inefficient system. I and mean, Ireland is now richer than Britain. They've got a very sensible um, political system that people like. Um, and the, the two countries in the Western world that are just horribly dysfunctional are Britain and the United States and we both have this similar uh, two-party polarized um, voting system. So the final thing I was wondering uh, regarding the system change is how do you think it will affect the Lib Dem? Like could the Lib Dems possibly have the chance of becoming the, the third, second or even first party in such a system change? Yes, we could. And, and of course, that's one of the arguments that our opponents employ. <laughs> they say, OK, you, you, you Lib Dems, you want voter change because you will get more MPs. Why, it's obvious why you're doing it. Um, so they think we're just acting out of self-interest, which is partly true. Um, no, I, I think if, if, if it happened, um, clearly our representation would grow, even in the disastrous elections of 2015 if it had been proportional we'd have finished up with 35 mps not eight last time you know last year december we'd have finished up with 60 65 not 11. so you know even if the proportionality was qualified in some way uh, we would have significantly better representation and we'll see that next year in the Scottish parliamentary election because the Lib Dems support of the popular vote in Scotland is really very low. It's, it's down as low as 5%. But we would probably get um, you know, five Scottish MPs uh, in the Holyrood Parliament on a proportional system. And our Scottish party are preparing for returning in bigger numbers. 
Okay, then uh, to end with on a, on a very different note. So you have, of course, been the Secretary of State for, for Business, Innovation and Skills. And currently we, th we see this very big international tech companies such as Facebook and, and Google having a huge impact on European societies. And we were wondering from your experience as a Secretary of State, how would you propose to deal with these very powerful international companies? Well, the first line of defense is, or well, in Britain's case, was the European Commission. There is a very good um, competition commissioner who has been, uh, uh, you know, very tough on the big tech companies. I mean, the, the, you know, the European Commission is, is a bit slow, uh, but at least they're trying to exercise some countervailing power which is impossible uh, for smaller countries on their own. And the United States doesn't want to take any action anyway. Um, Do you think it's, that is true? Whether well, a little is happening in America. Trump is very much opposed to tighter regulation of the big tech companies. Um, so the European Commission is the first line of defense. And I think the second is I, I'm very much in favor of doing what uh, Macron and actually, you now the British government is trying to do, which is to shift the tax base away from um, you know, the current system of taxing commercial property, and uh, which doesn't affect the Amazons and Googles very much, onto a turnover-based system. Uh, and we, you know, the British government has brought forward proposals on that, which I very strongly support. So I, th I think a combination of tax measures and effective anti-monopoly competition policy are the two ways forward. I think now we are leaving to um, create a new national system of competition policy and monopoly control. Um, and it's possible that even on their own, you know, Britain may be able to do something. I mean, Australia, which is quite a small country economically, has got a very tough and very effective um, system of regulation for the big tech companies in terms of content and privacy. Uh, so How I, do I, they do it in Australia? Australia, yeah. yeah the Australian system is quite sophisticated. Um, so how, how does the Australian system work? What do they do so well? Uh, well, they, they, they have a, you know, they, they regulate the kind of things which a national government can regulate. I mean, they, they have rules on content. Um, if a, a big tech company were to make um, acquisition of a, you know, growing small Australian software company, um, strengthening their monopoly power, they could intervene to stop it. So, you know, there, there is a role for medium-sized countries to adapt to the data age um, and Britain will have to do that but in the meantime you know the best um, you know the best practice is the European um, the European privacy data rules. Okay Mr. Cable we have uh, actually come to the end of the interview so um, thanks a lot for uh, being here today with us and on behalf of Carly and me and actually the whole team of Room for Discussion. We want to wish you the best of luck with everything in the future. Yes, and I hope the, the ballroom, ballroom dancing studios will open up soon again. Definitely. Yeah, they need to. <laughs>